Hey everybody, it's me, Jimmy Smith, again, this time doing my picks and predictions for UFC on ESPN 53, Hibas versus Nami Yunus. Once again, we're heading into UFC 300, we just finished 299, 298, two stacked cards. We're getting kind of the leftovers, uh, it's another UFC fight night where there aren't a ton of stakes for everybody on here, making them difficult to pick because you never know exactly what everybody's fighting for. Yes, you want to elevate yourself out of the uh, fight night category, but there aren't a lot of clear storylines to very many of these fights. We do in the main event, but not a lot for the rest. I'll go over them, tell you what I think, give you the odds rundown. So we start off with it is Fernando Padilla versus Luis uh, Pajuelo. Eight and one, making his UFC debut, is Pajuelo. And then uh, Padilla, Fernando, one and one in his UFC career. This is one of those things where when I look at the way Padilla fights, he reminds me a lot of, for example, Pat Curran in the UFC. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in Bellator, when I was calling Bellator. He was a Bellator champion, and one of the problems Pat Curran had is he kind of had one gear. And... When he was fighting Eddie Alvarez, for example, a lightweight before he went to 145, he was losing that fight from the beginning. He's down I mean, four rounds to none at one point. And you're going, is he ever going to go, all right, screw this. I'm going to get out ahead and, and try and put this guy away. He never did. And when Pat Curran was ahead, for example, first fight with Patricio Pitbull, it's hard to get past Pat. Once he's ahead of you. He never makes any glaring mistakes to let you back in. But if he's not ahead of you, he never hits that fourth gear to get ahead. So he was always trying to win rounds. Not that he didn't have knockout power because he did. But he was always trying to win rounds. But if he fell behind, it was hard for him to catch up. That's the problem with having such an even pace. And I see a similar kind of thing when I watch Padilla fight where he, he sets a particular pace. But he ends up having to... Um, yeah, but win rounds because he doesn't get far ahead enough to really put a lot of distance between him and the opposition. That's a little bit of a problem he has. Um, you know, Pohelo, of course, is is slightly different coming off uh, Dana White's contender series. Um, but he is more of a volume guy. He hasn't fought anybody great at the regional scene. I think his volume might be a little bit of an issue in this. And I'm looking at the odds of uh, uh, Padilla, the slight favorite. I wouldn't say there's a whole lot separating. I'd go uh, uh, Pajuelo because of the odds. I think the, the the pacing of Padillo might be a problem in this fight. I would definitely go Pajuelo by decision. Moving on, Billy Quarantillo versus um, a UFC, not newcomer, but coming, someone coming back to the UFC, uh, Yusef Zalal, who had two runs in the UFC. Billy Quarantillo is one of those guys. He's got an iron chin. He's a volume guy. He walks forward. He throws a lot of strikes. He tests you. Um, and he always believes that he can outlast you, right? It's in a war of attrition, I'm always going to win. I can always take more than my opponent. Now, that wears out, A, at a certain level, right? When you get to a certain level, you can't trade punches with the elite of most divisions. Number two, over time, your chin wears down. So time and opposition are working against you. I don't put Zalal in that category of opposition. So for Zalal, who, by the way, um, had to tangle with Ilya Teporia in Teporia's UFC debut, ended up on the wrong side of that one, but did hang with the champ, which is really hard to do, um, which you get some kudos for. But when the, the, the opposition got a little better, we saw that he wasn't quite there um, in the weight class. He isn't quite good enough to, to, to take on the elite of the elite in the featherweight division. And I don't think the elite of the elite, the, the, the guys who certainly have devastating power, can really do anything to Quarantillo. And his style is just hard to deal with. I got to go Quarantillo probably by late stoppage, let's say third round. Um, right now, Quarantillo minus 148, 150-ish, depending on your book. So one and a half favorite. I, I, I think that's worth a bet. I would go with Quarantillo. <clears throat> Moving on. It's a very interesting one to me because I really like um, Peyton Talbot um, taking on Cameron Simon. Uh, Cameron Simon, if you don't know who he is, he's a teammate of Dracus Duplessis and just coming off the first loss of his career to uh, Christian Rodriguez. Christian Rodriguez kind of been the prospect killer at 135, now 145. He went up to 145 in his last fight, but kind of the prospect killer at 135. And... Um, when it came to Cameron Simon, he has some skills on the ground. He has the ability to um, take you out of your element. He's kind of, you know, awkward on the ground, does have a really good guillotine, um, goes for some funky submissions, but he's not that athletic for the weight class. He's not huge for the weight class. He's not super athletic. And that's what I saw 
um, against Peyton Talbot. Peyton Talbot, the contrast for him, when I saw him, he is explosive. He is pretty powerful. He is young. He is really, really confident. Um, I see more physical skills for Talbot. I see a little bit more, more of a tactical edge for Cameron Simon in this one. I think the physicality of Peyton Talbot wins out, provided he doesn't get caught in a, a funky guillotine or some crazy scramble by Simon. I think Talbot is physically capable of just doing a bit more than Talbot. Right now, uh, I'm sorry, Talbot is capable of doing a little bit more than Simon. Right now, Talbot, uh, minus 148, a slight favorite. Still think it's worth a worth a bet. It's going to be a close fight. I do like Peyton Talbot in this one. I think he has a higher ceiling um, at 135 pounds. So I'm going with uh, Talbot in this fight. Edmund Shabazian, uh, if you know about Edmund Shabazian, was going to be the youngest champion, is what he said, was doing really, really well early on in his career, and they just ran into a wall. So looking at the A.J. Dobson fight, A.J. Dobson, 1-2 and two in the UFC, 7-2 and two overall, not very experienced, not a great fighter by any stretch of the imagination. Here's what you do with Edmund Shabazian if you're the UFC. You either use him to build up the guys who are coming up. And uh, I think that's what happened in the Anthony Hernandez fight, which was Edmund Shabazian's last loss. Um, they sent him against the veteran talent, Derek Brunson, Jakar Hermanson, uh, Nazuruddin Imovov, and he lost to all of them, finished by everyone but Jakar Hermanson. So a lot of his momentum just stalled. And then it was, okay, we're going to put him with another up-and-comer, see how he does. The up-and-comer, Anthony Hernandez, beat him. You have two choices if you're the UFC. You either kind of write the guy off, use him as fodder for another streaking up-and-comer, or you try and rehabilitate him and think, okay, we did invest a lot in this kid. He's only 26 years old. Maybe he can write the ship. They gave him the write the ship guy in A.J. Dobson. So part of the reason I'm picking Edmund Shabazian is I'm trying to see what the UFC is trying to do. And what the UFC is trying to do is if they had given up on Shabazian and they didn't think he was going to be anything great, they would give him to once again a 7-0, 8-0 red hot fighter, maybe just coming into the UFC. You, you know, feed, not that he's old, but you feed the, the old to the young. And not that he's old, but he's old in terms of the uh, amount of time he's been in the UFC, right? So they're not doing that, which makes me think UFC still has some faith in him. So they gave him somebody that, you know, they think he can beat. A.J. Dobson, just starting his UFC career, um, lost to Armin Petrosian, uh, Jacob Malkoon, right? You know, none of those guys are great. Um, so that's the problem is the, the Shabazian has more experience, is a bit more talented, a bit faster, but um, – and a bit younger, actually. So I got to go with Edmund Shabazian. He is the favorite by about two to one, but I still think it's worth worth a bet. So headed back to the card. Um, moving on to the heavyweights, it is Justin Taffa. We know him, hard hitting uh, Polynesian, of course, taking on Carl Williams. Here's the difference. Uh, Taffa is the underdog by one and a half. Williams is a favorite, almost two to one. Williams is the better wrestler. And that's been the kryptonite of the Justin Taffas of the world. He's a very hard hitter. But as you saw with Tai Tuavasa last week, I went with Tai Tuavasa. That wasn't a good move. You take him off his feet, put him on his butt, his, 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 his prospects go to about zero. If you stand and bang with Justin Taffa and you exchange punches, he can knock out anyone. But in this instance, Carl Williams isn't that experienced, 2-0 in the UFC, 9-1 overall. Once again, not that experienced, but neither is Justin Taffa. But he's a good wrestler. And the guys who can put the Justin Toffs of the world on their butts and keep them there are going to win. And right now, I think that style matchup favors Carl Williams. So um, he's a favorite, minus 180. So I'm going with a lot of favorites. We'll wait till the end. But I do got to say, I do have to say that the the style of Carl William Carl Williams puts him a little bit ahead of Justin Toffa. Probably Carl Williams, probably by decision. Amanda Hibas versus Thug Rose Nama Yunus. Let me start out by saying, Rose Namajunas, I don't have a lot of faith in her at 125 pounds. Yes, former champion at 115, um, coming off two straight losses, lost to Carlos Spars in one of the worst title fights of all time, then lost to Manon Fira. And what we saw there was Fira, who is not, who is an excellent fighter at 125, but not necessarily a bully. You know, there, there are bigger, stronger fighters at 125, kind of bullied Rose Namajunas. I don't have a lot of faith in her going up in weight class to 125. I don't think that fits her. I don't think she was a huge 115-pounder. She's a precise striker. She's not super heavy-handed. 
I don't know if she has the skill set for 125. And um, also, she's kind of a head case. I mean, Rose Namajunas, I don't think was ever comfortable as champion. Um, she's been up and down about wanting to continue the sport. She's taken time off before. I don't think she's in the right headspace to make a, a solid run, a new weight class at 125, where she has to kind of reinvent herself. Amanda Hebos, 12-4 and four overall, uh, has losses at 125, but Macy Barber, great fighter. Marina Rodriguez, great fighter. Um, wins over Vina Jandroba, Vivian Araujo. Vivian Araujo. I, uh, Paige Van Zandt was not great. She was sent out there to destroy Paige Van Zandt. That's exactly what she did. But she's well-rounded. She's she's big for the weight class, does have knockout power. I don't think Rose Namajunas can be able to bully her. And when I looked at the odds for this fight, I could not believe what I, what I was seeing. Depending on your book, Rose Namajunas is not just a favorite. She's a big favorite. Um, right now, what I'm looking at is minus 250. Hibas plus 205. Um, yeah, I know she did great things at 115, but new weight class, don't like where her head's at. As far as her career and her focus and all these things, I gotta go with the upset. I'm going with Amanda Hebos in the main event over Rose Nama Yunus. Probably doesn't really have what it takes to put her away, but I think she could win a comfortable decision. And with these odds, I think that's the smart pick. I'm going with Amanda Hebos over Rose Nama Yunus. Hopefully recovering from a bad week last week. We'll see what happens. But uh, let me know what you think in the comments section. Like, subscribe. I'll be back talking to you soon.